Welcome to Terror in Tandem, a podcast about finding entertainment in the macabre. Hosted by the knowledgeable and lovable Laura and Richard Mathiason. Each episode, we discuss the horror genre, from books to film to TV and beyond. Sometimes even from the beyond. <laughs> you can find us on our relatively new YouTube channel, Terror in Tandem, or online at terrorintandem.com and on our fantastic Instagram page at Terror in Tandem. Hello. Hello. How's that for showmanship, salesmanship? Pretty good. Horrorsmanship. Horror. Horrorsmanship. Wow. Wow. Well. And, a lot and, of ships. And horseman ships. So on this episode, we're going to be talking about ships. Welcome to ships. Ghost ships. Welcome to Ships and Bottles, the podcast. No, we're going to be talking about ghost ships. Mm. Horror on the high seas. Yar. We're not really talking about ghost ships. No, although but that could be a good it could episode. Be. I mean, I feel like we're we're coming up in real time. Thank you for joining us, everyone. As you this witness, this is our thought process. We just gold fart them out of our genesis. We just fart the ideas out of our brains. It, and whatever charts hit the chart, that's the ones we do. Paul Blart. Wow. I mean, I, I it really that faded out there. Really went off the rails. It did. It did. Of so the high seas. Are we of which about? this is the episode. <laughs> what is Ghost this? ships. You in the fucking high seas, man. So what are we talking about today? Because I know we're talking about something. We're talking about claustrophobia. <laughs> I hate it. Because I think I am claustrophobic. I always kind of knew that about myself. And when doing the research for this, I my heart was pounding. Was Through, it really? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think you're claustrophobic. You I would have, not have been able to go through that haunted house if no, you were. No, mildly, though. I I don't think there is a mild phobia. I mean, that's part of why phobia is. No, exist. trust me. Th- there is. There is. I So I used to be much worse. Um, I've gotten better. I can be in small spaces. I can be in elevators, airplanes, things like that. It doesn't, it, you know, I'm fine. It's just I have to not think about it. If I start thinking about it, I start to get pretty upset and anxious and i remember when i was younger you know and i'd like fight with my brother whenever he'd like pin me down or something because he's listen w- always been way way stronger than me uh yeah the, the nerdy horror loving theater kid uh didn't win most of his fights okay so anyway whenever he'd like pin me down it, it just it was the worst it, it freaked me the fuck out so badly um so I don't think that you are claustrophobic. Ah. I think that you, Can you like take a step back. Have a little bit of an issue with lack of autonomy or control. I don't so like when being you feel held like, down yeah, or smushed. When you feel like you maybe can't get out of a situation, I think that causes some response. But the other thing is Movies and stories with a claustrophobic theme absolutely frighten me more than other sure. subgenres. Like it's definitely uh, something I am, I'm much more afraid of claustrophobic stories and settings and whatnot than I am of say like you tight know, spaces monsters. can make you uncomfortable. It does not mean that you're claustrophobic. All right, I probably shouldn't say. have declared that as a disability. Then speaking of, let's define what claustrophobia is. Ah. And like how it manifests. Again, if you could just take a few steps back. Um, so claustrophobia is an intense fear of confined or enclosed spaces. Yes. Um, and fears of enclosed spaces and things like that are reasonable. A lot of people have them. And most of us try to avoid things that make us feel uncomfortable. But the difference between a fear Mostly. and a phobia is that a phobia is intense irrational and doesn't match the actual danger presented by the feared object or situation. Oh my God. Am I a phobia? I feel like (laughs) intense, irrational and doesn't match the situation is like my high school yearbook description. So scientists believe that neurochemicals overstimulate an area of your brain called the amygdala, Uh, which we've talked about before. Yeah. Mine is like a, it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Hercules from New York. It's just swole. 
There's buff. also thought that a single genetic mutation can increase your risk of claustrophobia if you have that gene defect. Oh, interesting. So like if you're born into like a tiny box? No, I think it's a genetic mutation that has nothing to do with claustrophobia. So like if your mom was born in a tiny box? No, it doesn't have anything to do with tiny spaces. Fine. It's a genetic mutation. Okay. Um, phobia. Interesting though that there's yeah. like a, a, a genetic mutation that makes you afraid of small spaces. That mm-hmm. kind of blows. Why isn't there a genetic mutation that makes you shoot lasers out of your eyes like Cyclops? I don't know. Phobias become a health issue when the fear interferes with the ability to carry out daily activities. Phobias can limit your ability to work efficiently, put a strain on your relationship, and reduce your self-esteem. So what does claustrophobia feel like? If you have claustrophobia, you feel anxious about being enclosed or in tight spaces, but you have trouble concentrating and functioning. You get overwhelmed with thoughts about being in that space, and these thoughts will keep you up at night. And your heart pounds. As a long-time sufferer of claustrophobia that we just recently established, um, <laughs> it definitely yeah, your heart pounds and you get sweaty. Physiological response, you get which sweaty. is sweaty, trembling, yeah. heart palpitations, heavy breathing. How common is claustrophobia? Pretty Only common, about I think. Twelve point five percent of wow. the population. Suffers Holy from shit! It. That's a lot of people. The average person with a specific phobia, such as claustrophobia, fears three objects or situations. About 75% of people with a specific phobia fear um, fear more than one object or situation. I mean, have you ever driven by like a high-rise apartment building and just felt like a sense of existential dread of just like that many people packed into that confined a space? No. Okay, so I'm fucking claustrophobic because that freaks me out so bad. That sounds like, you know, ennui, more like Do I need to go back to my well? Dread. Mm. Um, we just call that a Wednesday. Claustrophobia is more common in females than males, mm. although anyone at Sorry, any ladies. age can develop a specific phobia, but most develop in childhood and adolescence. Yeah. Wow. I know. So it... it, it um. It does come from the Latin word claustrum, which means a confined space or like a a small space, like a crawl space kind of. Um, And like all phobias from the Greek god of fear, Phobos, Mm. uh, one of the twin sons of Ares, who along with his brother Deimos, was also the god of fear. And the forgotten cousin, Bubos. (laughs) So Phobos and Deimos, which are uh, the two moons of Mars, um, which is the Roman name of Ares. So Phobos and Deimos, they would like um, basically... Ares would, uh, you know, be on the battlefield and Phobos and Damus would instill fear and terror and panic in the soldiers. Mm. Um, but they both kind of did the same thing, which is weird that everything's called a phobia and not a Deimos. You know, it could have been Cluster Deimos, mm. which sounds like Nostradamus is like It sounds cousin. like a, like an underground German tech band. <laughs> Yeah, welcome to Klotze Demos. We care about nothing. Um, and now the tech my pump. So we thought we would talk a little bit about some examples in horror. Yeah. Of claustrophobic, you know, films. I have a book. It's so it it's 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 a concept that's been known for a really really long time, but psychologically, as a term and as a an affliction to be studied, it was uh, the term claustrophobia was in. Only coined in 1879 mm. by uh, Benjamin Ball. And it was very popular amongst circles of the time, you know, uh, Jung and Freud and whatnot, each taking their own spins on why you were claustrophobic. Freud probably had something to do with the uterus, I'm guessing. <laughs> um, but uh, as a, like, studied affliction or disorder, it's it's kind of new on the map. But, God, I am still, sorry, blown away by the 12% number that is like astounding to me yeah i'm sure it's self-reported people that say they're (laughs) claustrophobic who have absolutely legitimate concerns yes that's fine well yes i i welcome uh my fellow sufferers uh (laughs) in in the wide open spaces of freedom and 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 will be unto any I in their if tiny you crawl can space. Be claustrophobic and agoraphobic. Oh, because I'm both. I totally am. I just need a medium space. I'm basically Goldilocks with a panic disorder. So, 
you want to get into some horror examples? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. You because claustrophobia it. is scary. It's fucking it, scary. It does. I honestly, there are a lot of great examples out there. Um, a lot of you may be thinking of buried alive movies or yes. examples or like saw things where you're confined in like a cell of some kind. And I've got a uh, like a but quick. We're going to talk about our our top. I've got a quick three. shout out mention at the end where I'll I'll bring up some recommend like quick ones if you want to check those kinds of movies out. But you're right, you're right. I didn't. I don't really have any Buried Alive movies on That's here. okay, but there are plenty. Oh, no. Never mind. Are you going to talk about your first? My first one is 1997's Cube, directed by Vincenzo Natale. This was his directorial debut, and Vincenzo Natale is a name you might be familiar with. He has done movies like Splice, which was really, really good, and In the Tall Grass, which was, oh, uh, you know, it's all right. But he's also directed lots of TV, including TNT favorite Hannibal. Uh, mm. We like that. Yeah, we do. So anyway, this movie was a straight to VHS gem that I saw when it came out because it had a couple character actors in it that I really liked, like David Hewlett. The yes, obviously you're thinking the guy from Scanners too. <laughs> That's what I was thinking as well. Oh right. Um, and then he went on to do Stargate Atlantis. And this is a, you also see a very 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 young Nicole De Boer right before she joined Deep Space Nine, which is the best Star Trek. Fight me, fight me. It's the best one. It's the best one. So anyway, Cube. This weird Canadian-American indie gem, I watched it because the box art was cool. I watched it because the box art was cool and because, like I said, it had these character actors in it that I liked. And it blew my mind. So five strangers wake up in a cube-shaped room. um, And each side of the room has an exit. To another cube-shaped room. Cubes in on that cubes exit, on cubes. yeah, we're talking cubes on. So imagine being trapped inside a giant Rubik's cube. That's essentially what this is. Now, um, the problem is the entrance to each. Each of the entrances has like a math problem or a logic problem on it that will tell you what awaits you on the other side. Sometimes what awaits you is just another cube-shaped room, and sometimes what awaits you is a room that bifurcates you or melts you with acid um that's a bummer so these five people uh they don't know why they're there they don't know where they are they don't know how they got there and they don't trust each other Mm. so it's do you know do you learn about their past you do now the thing about this movie is it's got these awesome traps and kills but that mostly happens in like the first 20 to 30 minutes of the movie at the most because this movie's really about this group of dysfunctional fucks that distrust each other screw each other over and really probably might have survived this ordeal if they worked together and overcame their differences some of them do and those are the ones that do better than others but this movie has been analyzed over and over and over again and most recently received a resurgence in critical analysis and popularity during the COVID lockdowns. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's a lot going on in this movie. There's a, it's a lot about interpersonal um, drama and, and how we relate to each other and the pitfalls of not working as a team. This is really a great lead in because um, multiple examples that I have, two of my examples fit into the same type of idea which is people that are by nature pitted against each other but might have faced a different outcome could they have worked together yes now this um this movie has two kinds of claustrophobia in it now once you start to really find out the nature of this cube building device thing that they're in you get this sense of, of oh my God, everyone, it's just another room. It's another room. It's another room. It's another room. There's no fucking way out. Um, then you kind of do, I don't want to give much away. I know the movie came out in 1997, but if you haven't seen it, really do yourself a favor and check it out. It It's, it's awesome. So I don't want to give too much away, but you do get a glimpse at what lies outside the cube, and that actually only heightens the claustrophobia of being trapped inside this thing. So 
the other part is you're trapped with these weird people you don't know, and there's some of them are fucking super sketchy, and you definitely can't trust them. So there's the claustrophobia of other people. Um, you can't get away from them because there are a limited number of safe exits. There's really only one way to go that won't kill you in a terrible, terrible way. Um, and this movie has since been analyzed as I just read a really interesting interpretation of it as a, a, a sort of screed against late stage capitalism. And, you know, I'm down for that. Um, but there are a lot of class issues going on in this movie. It is. Very, very cool. It's high concept. It's a real masterclass on how to make a an effective sci-fi horror movie on a very limited budget. This is an indie film, you know, and 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 was partly financed, I think, by the Canadian government. So um, hmm. I really, really recommend it. It spawned a couple of sequels that I haven't seen, and I know there's always perpetual talk of remaking it, probably with big special effects and missing the point of the original, which is this very small and intimate character drama that takes place in a weird sci-fi cube with death rooms yeah cube awesome where can you watch it oh i mean in anywhere just rent it somewhere i, I don't think know. you can watch it on prime probably um it's not hard to find it's a very it's a really well-known movie my first is the you descent always your first Ooh, from 2005 directed by neil marshall and he directed Dog Soldiers and Hellboy. We talked about some of those. Yep. Um, and it stars Shauna McDonald, Natalie Mendoza, and Alex Reed, among others. And on the surface, this film is a creature feature that sort of subverts the damsel in distress trope, where a group of tough women decide to go spelunking, caving. Um, one of the main women, Sarah, uh, suffers personal tragedy. Her husband, Paul, and daughter, Jessica, die a violent death. And in her grief, her gang of friends come together to help her heal by taking her on this extreme weekend of subterranean exploration. The claustrophobia of this film comes in a lot of different ways. One is the emotional suffering and grief of the main character like her grief is pressing down on her like she is being compacted by that's actually that's a really good point yeah Yeah. um and then we have the uh tangible claustrophobia of the actual scene and setting of the caves and the exploration of the stones and all the things that are happening. And then the other piece, which is this like creature that's coming to take them uh, and take them and keep them in this environment. Um, but there's a really sense of a big sense of loss. Uh, the violence coming from um, what Sarah has experienced, she feels constantly and seems constantly like, suffocating from it um she doesn't really talk too much about the actual grieving process she you know goes into this (laughs) blood-stained cave and i think my interpretation of this film essentially is as she moves through this cave she's like shedding some of her pain of her past she's moving through this painful experience and going towards the light where her grief is pressing in like the creature is pressing in like the cave is pressing in and everything everyone expects of her like get over it you gotta move past it it's like a violent rebirth for her she finds her way with all the blood and guts and the claustrophobia itself is wholly transformative she essentially starts as one broken person and in because she endured something so traumatic and has to like really go through the grief you know how everyone says in order to get past the grief you have to go through the grief that's what she's doing she is not only physically going through a trial 
but she is emotionally going through and she comes out on the other side totally unrecognizable not the same person that went in so i think the claustrophobia in here is a transformational process hmm. i also have read interpretations that this is like a uh, commentary on menstruation i mean there's a, a lot of blood that's for sure and also the, and goop yeah that some like the creature is the sperm trying to Ooh. impregnate con- and I keep mean, they are like al- albino creatures yeah and yeah. keep the, the you know and and get, wow impregnate the egg but the eggs like i'm gonna push through i'm gonna keep going to the light and then all the shedding happens i need to like watch that. this again i did not i just think said that's that. an interpretation no and that's the great thing about like serious critical theory is when you come across an interpretation like that it makes you kind of want to revisit it and watch it through that lens i definitely want to watch it through that lens because my take on the descent was you know it definitely is a lot about feminine dynamics and it plays somewhat into the trope of you know women being in competition with each other um there's (laughs) a lot like cube this group probably could have done a lot better if they had just worked together um but some of them do and some of them don't i the descent is so gnarly it is it's it's like want to really put it out for the viewer it's a terrifying movie it's a very violent movie and anyone who voluntarily goes through cave passages where like you're crawling and the rocks are pressing oh my god and you can't i mean there's no wiggle room no there's literally no wiggle room Ugh. and then the, the idea that the stillness millions of, that, of tons of bedrock are above you there's a scene that i'm thinking of particularly where yes, she I know exactly. plays dead oh god <laughs> and it's not such a claustrophobic experience as it is um trying not to move because of self-preservation, you know, trying not to let all this external fear take you over. There's also the mind added, over matter. The the added element of darkness in this film. Yeah. Even in a room with a bit of space, the darkness cl- essentially closes and that space off. And everything is like red, even when they light the yeah, the flares. Flares, because they that cast look. red. Mm-hmm. It's nothing like cooler than a flare in, in like a dark environment. It always looks great on film. But I just really like the idea of the the dual um, claustrophobic meaning of how grief can be completely crushing descending into your grief and yeah yeah, and also the physicality of the spaces of which they need to descend into gonna do our terror and tandem fans a solid and say skip the sequel yeah do not although it does pick up don't it just don't because honestly what i said which is sarah emerges a new person leaving her grief behind that's how you should end Some the movies movie. don't need sequels. Or does she emerge? Listen, just <laughs> just watch the first one for sure. That's so a that's great... my first. Oh, God, it's so scary. It's so it fucking is. scary. Do you want to take a break so I can sure. calm down yeah. from my claustrophobia? Mm-hmm. I'm going to go outside. The world's a scary place. It only makes sense you'd want to keep your loved ones safe by slowly poisoning them just above the threshold of death. But the tricky part has always been finding the right dosage. You want to keep your precious darlings weak enough to need you, but not so weak you can't have a social life too. (laughs) Don't get me started on overdoses. What a mess. Well, to all you concerned moms and totally normal boyfriends out there, have I got a wonderful product for you. Introducing Munchausen by Proxybox, a home meal delivery kit guaranteed to keep your charges physically weak enough to never escape your loving home fortress. Each Munchausen by Proxybox comes with a delicious pre-planned meal designed by our team of sarin gastronomers to delight the taste buds and crush the human spirit. Choose from an assortment of meals, from our classic chicken a la strychnine to our gluten-free pesticide platter. Don't take a chance that your loved ones will venture out into the world and get hurt, or worse, decide they don't need you anymore. 
keep them close and compliant, without the hassle or worry of looky-loos at the grocery store. Order Munchausen by Proxy Box today and get a free window sealing kit that neighbors won't notice. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. We do not condone nor endorse poisoning people because you are literally unlovable. (sighs) Okay, all right. Breathed into a paper bag, stood outside for a while. Still feel terrible. Yeah, because you're agoraphobic too. Oh, God, that's it. I need to find a medium space. Medium spaces, everyone. Can I go? Yeah, go. Me, Mm -hmm. me, my my next one, my next one, my next one is really good. It's a classic. I, of course, am talking about 1988's Dutch classic, Spoorloos. Special shout out to Heather Penna. Heather Penna. I mean, listen, I knew that. Uh, my beloved co-host would be impressed because this is Heather Penna's favorite horror movie. When someone asks you what your favorite horror movie is and you combat them with spore loose, holy shit. Yeah. You've got my attention. Penna obviously does not like to be driving on the roads. Well, that's the American remake you're thinking because in spore loose, they were on a bike trip because oh. it's a European film. They don't always have to drive their dumb fucking cars <laughs> everywhere. I said riding, didn't I? Or I said driving. Anyway, spore loose, also known as The Vanishing, directed by the late, great Georges Sluzier. I hope I'm getting that correct. Um, this movie is a masterpiece. Now, it was remade in America by... Uh, Sluzier uh, in 1993 starring Jeff Bridges and Kiefer Sutherland skip that one it's no good Um, (laughs) now the original is about young couple Rex and Saskia who are out on a bike biking vacation you know as 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 you do in beautiful Holland Uh, they stop at you know a rest station to get some snacks and supplies and Saskia goes missing completely There is not a hint or trace of her. No one saw anything. No one knows anything. Rex spends the next three years losing everything because he is completely obsessed with finding what happened to Saskia. Everyone else has moved on. The case is closed. Friends and family all think, she left you. She's gone. He is not convinced. All of a sudden, Rex starts getting postcards from a man named Raymond claiming to know exactly what happened to Saskia. So they meet and Raymond uh, says, essentially, I will take you to Saskia. I will tell you everything that happened to her, but you have to go through it the same exact way she did. And Rex really seeing no other option, agrees to it. Well, he's already probably been through a lot, you know? So what follows is a bleak, terrifying, very dark psychological thriller of Raymond taking Rex through all of the things he did to Saskia. And it contains the double horror of, you know, imagine being in that situation and watching Rex Rex going through it. But at the same time, You're thinking, oh, my God, Saskia already went through this. So every elevation, everything that happens, every new horrible punishment that is inflicted upon Rex, you you know that poor Saskia has been through this already. And the claustrophobia, it's a little hard to talk about because I would be spoiling uh, the end of the movie. Well, I can also say, I mean, I have not seen this, but I'm planning to. Um, It is phenomenal. I can interpret some of claustrophobia coming from living alone with this knowledge that you know Saskia was taken or is missing. Like she didn't leave and no one believes you. That is part of it is the social claustrophobia of being isolated. Yes. This man's world contracts to nothing when he loses Saskia because he loses the love of his life and no one is willing to believe that it's, it's people are just too willing to think listen she left you and this is pathetic now you're you're being you know pathetic you have to move on with your life and he is the only one who, who refuses to do that there's also the claustrophobia of being kidnapped mm-hmm. uh he is is he blindfolded at times 
he definitely has his agency taken away from him. He The first thing he uh, has to go through is be chloroformed. And the thing with Saskia is, you know, when this happened to her, it happened to her. With happening to Rex, Raymond is explaining what's going to happen to him, basically. He's saying, now you have to be chloroformed. I'm going to do it. And Rex has to sit there and let this happen. Um, so obviously things increase. Uh, things escalate to an ending that is an all-time classic. I would be doing a great disservice if I if I said any more. The r- large reason the American remake stinks so badly is it changed the ending um, in a way that completely defangs all of the movie. This movie is bleak. It's not a feel-good film. It doesn't have heroes. It's about a desperate man who meets a very, very bad person. <laughs> now, Raymond is played by Bernard-Pierre Donadieu, who plays him beautifully. And I really, really want to stress, Raymond is not a nice man. He does not do good things. If you like movies like The Hitcher, you're going to mm, goddamn love, that love movie. this movie. It's one of my favorites. Laura, I cannot recommend this to you enough. This is a very taut psychological thriller and when you see movies like this it's fascinating to watch this and watch the american remake to judge what audiences are able to handle in different parts of the world and what studio executives decide they're able to handle because there are changes made in the american version that you feel like someone watched the dutch version and said oh well our precious baby americans could never tolerate such severity in their films well fuck you so Spore loose, 1988. Oh, the claustrophobia comes from many places, but it does come specifically from one scene that, trust me, once you see it, man, it is, whew, it's, it's, it's a, it's, 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 it sticks with you. It's a hanger on her. Mm. It's a spore loose. Um, Guys, couple, got a couple of spores loose, you know what I'm talking uh, about? Yeah, spore cling. Um, my next is Devil. Oh, shit. From 2010. Now you this... know who else's favorite movie that is? Devil? Otis. Oh, stop with the elevator. Otis loves it. Listen, this is not going to be the best film you've ever seen. It's pretty I'm good, though. I'm putting it out there right now. It's but good. I think it is highly underrated and heavily enjoyable. Agreed. And really captures a great visual sense of claustrophobia and also what a lot of people fear when they think of being claustrophobic, which is being in an elevator. Yes. Or being in the dark in an elevator or being around strangers in an elevator. Just so anything around elevators. This film stars Chris Messina, Jenny O'Hara from Mystic River and Extract, Bokim Woodbine from Bokeem Fargo. Bokim Woodbine. Yeah. Shit, yeah. And Queen and Slim. From and everything. Logan Marshall Green, one of our favorites yes. from The Invitation and Upgrade. Yeah, we love him. It's He's great. produced by M. Night Shyamalan and directed by John Eric Dowdle. And I want to say this about the director. He has claustrophobia in a lot of his films. He also directed oh, yeah. As Above, So Below Which, and Quarantine. Okay, As Above, So Below is a movie I, I almost did for this episode, but I am saving it for another themed episode. It's fantastic. Well, you wait your turn because I'm talking about Devil. I'm just saying it's really good. So Devil is about five strangers trapped in an elevator in a high rise. The power starts to become intermittent, and then each time the lights shut off, a new savage attack is perpetrated on one of the five people. Detective Bowden, played by Chris Messina, tries to make sense of what's happening while also trying to get the five people to survive. Yeah, and he's not in the elevator. He's like in the control no, center. No, and I do talk about that as a uh, filming technique. It's like the Apollo 13 thing. They start to turn on each other and there's nothing that can be done because fate is already written. So the film starts out with the skyline of Philly and it's then inverted as the camera swoops in and then goes into this building and it lends itself to the tiny claustrophobic setting of the elevator. So it wide, wide shot, inverted and then into an elevator. It's a great and I I feel like that was 
maybe Shyamalan was like, it has to be in Philly. If I'm going to produce this, you have to. It has to be Philly. I'll talk about a little bit about Shyamalan's intent with this film in a minute. Um, so the majority of the film takes place in the elevator. Um, the filming of the tight quarters is done with many different angles, including the utilization of the security camera in the elevator where Messina and the building security are on the other side of the camera, helplessly watching. Religion also plays a large part as this film is essentially a morality tale. Um, and if you take this con connection a little bit further, come with me a little bit. Think about the confessional box and think about the elevator being essentially a confessional box of these five people and the implication of the claustrophobia of faith and sin and consequence oh, yeah. all bearing down the on these characters. The devil of the title is not like a clever, it's no, very literal. It's pretty overt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to give away, you know, what happens, but I will tell you that Everything's connected. All of these characters are connected. Yeah. And it really comes together very masterfully, which uh, obviously M. Night Shyamalan didn't direct this film because it's so well Because the ending executed. works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because um, it's not like 80% a great movie and then 20% absolute what the hell. But the limited visual aspect of things happening in the dark, there are different um, flashes of something that people can't quite explain or understand. There's a loss of communication, of sound, and nobody really understands what's happening. And like you said with your first example of um, your film, they a cube. cube they don't work together they really are against each other and when people start to get injured severely injured they turn on each other very quickly i mean it's really like they tie people up i mean in this small elevator there's really only four corners to go into and that's not a lot of space no it's an elevator so th this film devil was the first installment of the night chronicles trilogy where M. Night Shyamalan was intending to have three different directors helm each one of three different stories. And, it, you know, way to lean into your name for a, a great title, honestly. Because of the happening and the last airbender flops, mm. the trilogy was abandoned. But Which we is a bummer. do have Devil. And I think that's part of why That's this the is only good movie you just mentioned. Yeah. Devil. Because that stinks. Why didn't they do more of those? Because the happening in the area. I know. I, I'm just saying it, it's a bummer that we lost all the money, that, uh, and funding, and trust. And even when they showed this trailer, people I feel laughed bad. when they saw M. Night Shyamalan's name listed. I feel bad for John Eric Dowdle because, like, imagine directing a movie and getting this chance, and then someone else's mistakes. But forget it. all that and listen to what I'm saying. It's this good. is a good horror film. It's really good. And it does lean into the claustrophobia and the morality of choices and decisions and connectivity with seemingly strangers that you may be trapped with. In Farts tight spaces. are not the worst thing that can happen on an elevator. Let's just put it that way. No, but they are pretty bad. But do you remember that episode of L.A. Law from like a million years ago when she fell down the elevator shaft? That character? It's like a really famous episode where the, the lawyer just Which walked Which lawyer? In. Yeah, it was Rosalind. Um, like right at the end of an episode, the elevator door opens and she doesn't look and she steps in and goes ah, all the way down. And I just remember that because when that episode came out for years afterwards, my parents Check, would like make sure yeah, literally hold me when the doors open and I'd be like enough. Yeah, I know it's a bad way to go. Yeah. That's like when the writers really want to get you off the show. Yeah, but it, it's. I think it's become a meme at this point um, for for like people who aren't a hundred years old like me. Um, anyway, can I go next? One of the, I just want to say that um, one of the characters in the film Devil does actually suffer from claustrophobia. So it's interesting to see how he gets through that. Yeah, I wonder if this makes it, that. made it better. A little exposure therapy to well, There's no making it better. And, you know, um He's no longer devil. claustrophobic. Oh. Oh, that's good. I'm guessing he's no longer a few other things too. Like You're going to have living... to watch just came out in 2010, so it's only 13 years old. <laughs> 
You know, I'm going to uh, fast forward to, to um, well, not the current decade, but it's close. So my last filmatic recommendation is 2019's Masterpiece uh, from Robert Eggers. Yes, I'm talking the lighthearted romp that is The Lighthouse, a movie that my co-host and wife refuses to even watch the trailer to. Um, that's how fond she is. I watched is. enough of it. You're fond of me lobster, ain't ye? So anyway, The Lighthouse. Yes. Listening to you quote the film all the time, too. Yes. And, and all these years later, Anytime still almost I say daily beans. occurrence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, why did you spill your beans? So anyway, whew, The Lighthouse. Now listen, Robert Eggers is one of my favorite directors. He's not for everybody. He did The Witch. He did The Northman. Mm, um, that's an amazing yeah, film. Yeah, you loved The Northman. Loved The Northman. I am in on whatever. His next film coming up is a remake of Nosferatu, starring Bill Skarsgård as Count Orlock. I mean, The Northman was like a very Beowulf tale, you know? Well, it's it's the it's the uh, origin story of Hamlet, the story of Amleth. Um, so you're not wrong. It is quite Danish. But um, I'm talking about The Lighthouse. Now, The Lighthouse started – the story of it is actually very interesting as well. So it's it, the idea of this movie started when uh, Robert and his brother Max were discussing a project Max had been working on. He had been trying to adapt Edgar Allan Poe's last work, which was essentially two pages of an unfinished work called The Lighthouse. Um, Poe never finished it because he mysteriously died in the streets of Baltimore, which – you know, happens. So um, the other inspiration for this was now Max was uh, Max Eggers was having trouble. Robert said, let me have a crack at it. And they both started working on it together and combined it with the real story of lighthouse keepers Thomas Howell and Thomas Griffith, known back then as the two Tommies. Um, so these were two lighthouse keepers who pretty famously hated each other. That must have been a fun job. Mm. Uh, now, they manned the Smalls Lighthouse, which was 20 miles off the coast of Pembrokeshire in Wales. And that is a cold and stormy place. So, Yeah, it's got a lot of whales. In 1801, Griffith, um, while the two men were on the island, Griffith was injured in a freak accident. And they were beset by storms. So nobody could come and get them. So Griffith lay in agony for... an indeterminate amount of time but it's thought weeks until he succumbed that must have been something uh now howell the survivor was pretty traumatized by all that and also very aware of the fact that everyone knew the two men fought all the time so he thought if anyone found out or you know if he if he got rid of the body they would he would be considered a murderer so he kept the body which started to do what bodies do it decomposed so then he made a makeshift casket right outside the lighthouse, and he tied it to the side of the lighthouse and put the body in. But uh, the storms broke it apart. So one night, um, visible from inside while uh, Thomas Howell was deeply losing his mind at this point, um, the casket broke apart, exposing the arm of the rotting corpse and waving it in the air in a quote-unquote beckoning manner. Hmm. Now, by the time Howell was relieved, when the boat came for him, his hair had turned white, he had lost much, much weight, and was so disheveled and crazy that even his loved ones didn't recognize him. Mm. So, was anyway... It, was it him, or was it the other guy? <laughs> interesting. No, it, it was Howell, because they found, they found Griffith's body. Um, he was but not he accused was of murder. He in the water that whole time, so he must have been unrecognizable too. Maybe. He wasn't in the water. He was just outside, you know, rotting. In the elements, right. Um, but I'm just so thinking they're who's who. This came together into the lighthouse. Now, the lighthouse is claustrophobic in a few different ways. First and most obvious is the very bizarre aspect ratio that this movie is shot in now aspect ratio just refers to the size of the the screen you're watching like 16 uh nine aspect ratio is like letterbox it's like widescreen four to three like aspect what you ratio see when you go to the movie theater. yeah four to three aspect ratio is 
what you would see like in the eighties on yeah. a on a you know a like square TV. Like if you TV. rewatch an old TV show like Nine Hundred Two One Zero. Exactly. Now this movie was shot in a one one nine one aspect ratio, which is not something that anything has really been shot in. What it kind of looks like is a stamp. It's a square. It's interesting. It's, it's like also in black and white. If you're looking through a projector viewfinder, yes. it really does give it a sort of almost like vaudevillian look. Now, um, in this movie, we have two characters, and that's it. It's Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe. And a mermaid, right? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of hallucinations and weird stuff that that comes up. So, essentially, these two men um, man this lighthouse together and go insane. Um, Now, the claustrophobia comes from, like I said, the, the aspect ratio of the film itself, but also the very real fact that these two men are in this tiny lighthouse on an island that is not much bigger than the lighthouse itself for a very long time. Mm -hmm. They uh, Pattinson has a pretty dark past that he he hints at and Willem Dafoe, if he even exists at all, is a bit of a cad. He he definitely like fucks with with, uh, Pattinson a bit. He's also pretty unpredictable and weird. Now, Pattinson starts to hallucinate. He at one time kills a seagull, which is very, very bad luck. And terrible things beset him. Now, this is a movie that definitely benefits from a bit of foreknowledge. If you (laughs) know a bit about the history of this movie, if you've read Samuel Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, if you know your Greek mythology, and if you know your H.P. Lovecraft, you're going to get a lot out of this movie. Um... It also warrants the patient viewer because it's an Eggers film. It's a slow burn. But the performances are spectacular. Willem Dafoe, Pattinson's great, but Willem Dafoe is so good in this movie. He's meant to be a lighthouse keeper. Basically, you get the sense that you're not watching Willem Dafoe, or if you are, that he's always been a lighthouse keeper this whole time. And he only does movies like every once in a while, he'll shave and come out and do a movie. And that's the acting part. And then he goes back to being a lighthouse keeper. He's so good in this role. It's unfucking believable. It is un, it is surprisingly a funny film as well. There's a ton of bleak, strange humor in this movie it's very particular humor. I'm not going to say it's kitschy or funny, haha, laugh out loud, but there is a darkly comic streak to this film. Now, these two men can find they can't escape each other. They can't escape the storms. They can't escape the two rooms that they have. Or they the can't island. escape this island. And then ultimately, they can't escape their past, their minds, and the madness that's closing in on them. And Robert Pattinson, when he damns himself, can't escape his fate. Everything sort of feels like it was always going to end the way it ends. And that is, to me, the greatest sense of claustrophobia is predestination. The idea that you can be cursed, that you can be fated, that you are confined to uh, uh, the, the, the space, the box that, the, muse, that the, the fate weavers have put you in. There's nothing that you do will alter that. You can bash against the, the confines of your fate as much as you want and rage and scream and desperation but it's going to happen and to me there's nothing more terrifying and claustrophobic than that and you really really get a sense of that in the lighthouse you kind of from the very beginning feel like oh robert pattinson's fucked in this movie and try as he might there's no way out it's very surreal and allegorical you can be interpreted as a personal hell i think is one way to watch this movie that that perhaps these characters are already dead and This is hell because it definitely feels that way at times. But for the patient viewer who doesn't mind a surreal narrative and not having everything really spelled out for them, I can't recommend this movie enough. It it is brilliant. It's an absolute work of art. And it's not jump out of your seat scary, but it's dreadful. It instills a sense of panic and dread because you feel trapped along with these characters Mm. um i love this movie to death i know it's not your cup of tea and i freely admit that it won't be everyone's cup of tea either it's a niche movie but if this is your thing baby i got a movie for you or your cup of beans Mm. well my last is a book and i have to say that we have not mentioned this author 
in our 75 episodes and it's too bad because really she's one of my all-time favorites let's hear it so the book is black water written by joyce carol oates oh my gosh from 1992 good one so this is a novella actually and it's based on the chappaquiddick accident in which senator ted kennedy drove off a one-lane bridge In July of 1969, he was able to escape, but his passenger, campaign staffer, Mary Jo Kopechny, drowned. And in Ah, the novella, which is a fictional retelling, um, Joyce Carol Oates changes the names of the characters, naming Kennedy's character simply as the senator, and Mary Jo is Kelly Koechner. And... She updates the time frame from 1969 to the Reagan era. So those are the things that are like based on what actual have what actually happened and then Oates interpretation of it. And so this is where Oates fiction is so well told is she really dives deep into the mind of Kelly Koechner um, talking about all of her thoughts and her hopes and dreams and imagining what it was like for her to meet such an important senator and become the object of his attention. Oh, it's so tragic. And this all takes place in a fractured timeline of where this accident happens and then we bounce around of Kelly's thoughts and memories as she is slowly drowning throughout the novel. Um they meet on the 4th of July, he woos her, and then obviously it becomes her fate. Fatal and he, fate. quite famously in real life, didn't contact the authorities for like a day. And they, I mean, she, uh, and, and Oates's way of telling what happens is really, really well done. So through flashbacks to Kelly's past, we learn how she became interested in politics, um, uh, how she formed her political opinions, and just like Mary Jo, she's young and has the, her whole future ahead of her so that when she does ultimately get into a car with the senator who's had too much to drink, it's even more tragic when her life ends. She t- makes the tale very claustrophobic because she constantly recounts the car accident in a lot of different ways throughout the story. She talks in excruciating detail of how Kelly must have felt and thought during her final moments. It focuses on mental illness, suicide, and some other political hot button issues. But the details of the drowning and the impact from Kelly's perspective is where the claustrophobia really hits. It's so intense that it almost seems like you are a passenger in the car with Kelly Uh. as she sees her life slowly end. I'm thinking specifically of the senator uses Kelly's shoulder as a push off trajectory so that he can get to the surface and she's watching him. And thinking he's going to just grab his breath and come back down. But he does not come back down. He goes to the surface. He goes to a payphone. And this is very famously the truth. He goes to a payphone and first call is to his lawyer. He does not call the authorities. And so in this retelling, Oates uses repetitive language to intensify this dread and the closing in of the tragedy. And when you're drowning, a lot of things happen where things start to get dark around you. And, you know, there's a lot to be told about the claustrophobia of drowning. It's a tough read. It is a tough read. Like, actually, a lot of Oates' work. (laughs) But she constantly returns to the drowning and tells it from every single angle. And that really does, although it, it, it almost makes a claustrophobia tell, retelling of the drowning because it's surrounding the drowning till she drowns. So it's like closing in on the actual death of this character. And like I said, we have not mentioned Joyce Carol Oates in this podcast at all, sadly, because she is incredible i mean zombie is one of the most disturbing books i've ever read absolutely but this i really wanted to talk about because it is such a tragic retelling of uh, a character who often doesn't get 
the story or the headlines. No, unless she's being used as like a political hit job point, you know, for these assholes to attack each other. She's very rarely thought of as an actual person. Right. It's like Ron Goldman. Yeah. We should be talking more about the tragedy of Jeez. his passing as opposed to the perpetrator, alleged perpetrator. No, the murderer. Um, alleged. Not 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 found guilty, so mm. we're not gonna put that claim sure. and be sued because we know certain people have time on their hands and we never know when we could get a cease and desist. Yes. We it, really made it if we got one. If I did it. But yeah, so um this actually happened. I'm sure that Ted Kennedy did everything he could to make sure that he didn't get caught. Yeah, I think he called his brother. He called his lawyer. Yeah. Cool. Rich people, you know, must be nice. Kill. So check that out. It's a novella. It's pretty short, but it is really tragic, but really, really great. Holds up after all these years. Yeah. No oh. cell phones, pay phones. Honestly, Sorry. Sorry, kiddos. Anything by Joyce Carol Oates is worth a read. Foxfire, my God. She, she was quite prolific as well. A um, couple quick mentions that, you know, listen, we, we, claustrophobia is a very common theme because so many people suffer from it. Filmmakers go back to mind that well pretty often. I kind of on purpose didn't mention Alien because so much has been written and about the claustrophobia of that movie, you know, crawling through the corridors, being in a spaceship itself carries with it a, an innate sense of claustrophobia because you are confined to that space. Cause going outside of it means death, mm-hmm. horrible, horrible death. Uh, your blood boiling, your skin freezing, your air, uh, your lungs exploding if there's air in them. So, yeah. Uh, also, Alien is a great example of it. There are other movies like Buried, uh, yeah. The Borderlands, The Thing, and probably the scariest one, 127 Hours, which I would argue would be even scarier if James Franco had been trapped there with a young female student of his. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but that's not a horror movie. But uh, 1408. I mean, he, he chops his own arm off with it like a set of keys. 1408. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Misery. The hotel one, right? Gerald's Game. Gerald's Game. So yeah. those are some of Stephen King's claustrophobia. Forays. Yeah, he's definitely he's definitely that hit that with one. Ryan Reynolds buried. Buried. I said yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah, um, it's okay. The Saw movies. Anything where you're in confinement. Particularly Saw one because they're essentially in that one room the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So check it out or don't. Listen, cuddle <laughs> up in a tiny nook. Um, make sure that there's no way out and enjoy some of our recommendations. Yeah. And we hope you enjoyed this episode of Murder on the High Seas. PSA, everyone. Poke breathing holes in your tiny box. Trust me on that one. Ahoy. Terror in Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our theme was written and performed by Carrie Denver, and all other music was written and performed by David Suspanik. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. We're standing right behind you.